All right, I think we're going to get started here. I'm just going to make sure everyone can hear me okay. Just going to type a message in the chat. We have someone on the line who can also help troubleshoot if anyone is having trouble hearing, so feel free to chat. Otherwise, without further ado, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So greetings and welcome to today's SPH alumni webinar focused on harm reduction and syringe services programs. I'm Kate Walshans with the SPH Alumni Society Engagement Committee, and I want to say thanks to all alumni, students, and friends of the School of Public Health who have made time to join us live today. I also want to extend my thanks to all of my fellow committee members who've made today's webinar possible. And some of you may know that this webinar is part of our 2019 public health lecture series that's focused on substance abuse in Minnesota. And we invite everyone to join us next week for our final installment of the lecture series. And details and registration can be found on our website at sbhalumni.umn.edu. So we invite everybody um, to ask questions at any time. You can type them into the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. You'll see there's a spot for a chat, but then there's another bar right below that that says Q&A. So we'll be keeping an eye on those questions along the way. So please submit your questions at any time. And then we'll also have time at the end of today's webinar strictly devoted to questions. And so now I'd like to introduce the presenter of this webinar, Kate Erickson. And Kate works with the Minnesota Department of Health. And as the Opioid Overdose Prevention Director, she launched the Opioid Dashboard, which is a one-stop shop for opioid-related data and information. And currently, Kate's working on a temporary project with NDH related to injection drug use, infectious disease, and overdose response. And prior to working at MDH, Kate worked in community health centers with an accountable care organization as the integrated care program manager, where she ran programs in care coordination, chemical health, advocacy services, expert implementation, and behavioral health integration. And Kate wor Kate's work currently includes improving chronic pain management and opioid prescribing guidelines, motivational interview training, and launching clinic-based buprenorphine programs. Kate brings over 15 years of experience in community organizing, strategic planning, program development, group facilitation, staff supervision, advocacy, and teaching. So welcome, Kate. It's great to have you, and we will turn things over to you. Thanks so much. So, um, first, the learning objectives. Today, we're going to focus on what is harm reduction, what is syringe access, what is a syringe service program, or SSP, and how do SSPs impact the opioid epidemic and prevent infectious disease. Before discussing harm reduction strategies and the need for sterile syringes, it's important to have an understanding of the opioid epidemic. This graph is from Minnesota Department of Health data in uh, death certificates, and it shows the total opioid-involved deaths from 2000 to 2017. The blue line is all opioid-involved deaths. So in 2017, 422 Minnesotans died of an opioid-involved death. The green line is what we would consider commonly prescribed opioids. These are still the leading cause of opioid-involved deaths in Minnesota, and this is not true in other states in our nation. There's been three waves in the opioid epidemic. First, prescription opioid-involved death, then heroin-involved death, and now fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. It's important to note that while fentanyl can be a prescription, like a fentanyl patch that could be prescribed for a terminal illness or cancer-related pain, 
When we're talking about fentanyl-involved deaths, we are usually talking about illicitly produced fentanyl. Also, even when other drugs are used, cocaine, methamphetamine, it can be cut or laced with fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Opioids are, a, are often the drug that is causing the death more so than other drugs because opioids cause respiratory depression, meaning slow or troubled breathing. The other important thing to note about this change in the death is that the route of use is changing as well. So whereas if a death is caused by a prescription opioid, the route of use is swallowing or snorting, whereas if the drug involved in death is fentanyl, fentanyl analog, it's more than likely snorting or injecting. I want to make sure that we're on the same page about what a substance use disorder is. It's diag diagnosed by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-5. And for example, for a mild substance use disorder, a person would have two to three criteria, such as taking the opioid in larger amounts and for longer than intended, having cravings or a strong desire to use opioids, wanting to cut down or quit and not being able to, spending a lot of time obtaining the opioid, or continued use despite problems. Early detection of symptoms of dependence and or addiction provide an opportunity for early intervention. So while most of us on this webinar won't be the one who's actually diagnosing the substance use disorder, everyone might be in a position to observe the signs and symptoms early on. Opioids have received a lot of attention. While there are many drugs out there, again, opioids are one of the most fatal because of the respiratory depression. However, even with opioids, while death is the most profound impact, death is the smallest impact in terms of numbers. For every one opioid-involved death, there are two opioid-related hospital admissions, four opioid-related emergency room visits, seven opioid-related EMS runs, and 30 opioid-related treatment admissions. So I'm going to repeat those numbers. For every one death, there are two hospital admissions, four emergency room visits, seven times that paramedics respond to a 911 call, and 30 treatment admissions. So when we think about who's impacted by the opioid epidemic, what we're actually thinking about is everyone who has experienced pain, trauma, and suffering or who may experience pain, trauma, and suffering, and everyone who knows, works with, or loves them. So I do not think it is an underestimate, underestimate to say that everyone is connected to or has been impacted by the opioid epidemic in some way, directly or indirectly. The question becomes, what creates the demand for altering substances in the first place? Below any diagnosable condition is pain, trauma, and suffering, physical pain, emotional and psychological pain, or both. Next, we're going to take a look at some data. This is drug treatment admission data, the primary drug at the time of admission. It comes from DANES, which stands for the Drug and Al Alcohol Abuse Normative Evaluation System, quite a mouthful, it's called DANES. It's a Department of Human Services data source. This is a time lapse from 1995 to 2017 showing admission for heroin and other opioids, which would include prescription opioids, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, and methamphetamine. As you see, the admissions or the numbers start to come on here. I want to point out that the dotted line is representing injection drug use. So there you see the increase in methamphetamine, which peaked in 2005. After that time, legislation passed that limited the production of methamphetamine in Minnesota, and it came back down about to the level of other drugs. Then you see prescription opioids going up, then heroin going up and actually surpassing prescriptions, and a continued increase to 2017. So I want to stay on this graph for a minute. There are so many takeaways from this data. 
Number one, I'm sure we all can recall the meth epidemic in 2005, and now methamphetamine treatment admissions are more than double what they were in 2005. And we all remember when we got really concerned about prescription opioids starting in 2000, and they actually started leveling off around 2010 and even decreased slightly. Now we have a huge increase in methamphetamine and opioids, illicitly produced prescriptions, heroin, fentanyl, and fentanyl analogs. So more than an opioid epidemic, we have an injection drug use epidemic and a substance use disorder epidemic. Next, we're gonna look at the geographic distribution of injection drug use. Again, this is from Dean's data, Drug and Alcohol Abuse Normative Evaluation System. This graph is very complex, and so we're gonna walk through it a little bit. It's narrowed down to the last decade. On the left, 2007. On the right, 2017. So remember when we looked at the opioid-involved deaths and saw those different trends from prescription opioids to heroin to fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and how the route of use was changing? Well, on the left, if we look at the, the scale, there's only three options, and it caps out at two people per 1,000. And that's only in a few areas. The majority of them are less than one per 1,000. In 2017, the entire state is at least the darkest color from the previous, previous charts. So the darker colors are indicating more and more use. So the important thing to recognize about this graph is that the, the takeaway point is that between 2007 in 2017, there's been a 300% increase in injection drug use. And this is data that represents the people who have been admitted to treatment. And we certainly know that there are many more people out there who are not getting the help that they need yet. Nationally, the data shows that only one in 10 people who have a substance use disorder actually get into treatment. Now we're gonna take a look at the vulnerability assessment, which is conducted by the Minnesota Department of Health that looked at which counties are at most risk for rapid dissemination or an outbreak of hepatitis C. To make sure that we know why we're talking about this, injection drug use is the number one risk factor for the transmission of hepatitis C. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, developed a methodology to examine the potential for rapid dissemination of hepatitis C virus, also called HCV, that was associated with injection drug use. The statistical model takes into consideration county-level data on factors associated with injection drug use. The CDC analysis highlighted the top 220 counties around the United States, none of which were in Minnesota. In order to understand the risk in Minnesota, this analysis was replicated with Minnesota county data. The results showed that counties in Northeast and North Central Minnesota were the most vulnerable to rapid dissemination of HCV associated with drug use. Now that we've talked about the context for what's been going on in Minnesota in terms of the need for harm reduction and sterile syringes, Let's talk about the principles of harm reduction. Harm reduction is a recognized public health model that's been used since the, the early 1980s to reduce the harms of active drug use, including reducing the transmission of infectious disease. So to reiterate, it's been around for 40 years. Harm reduction accepts that licit and illicit drug use is a part of our world and it chooses to minimize or reduce the harmful effects rather than to ignore, condemn, or criminalize them. The biggest misconception is that harm reduction denies that drugs are harmful. In fact, harm reduction addresses and mitigates the harms to people who use drugs and others. In other words, if drug use is happening, then let's work to make it less harmful. 
Rather than ignoring it or condemning it, it is addressing the harms associated with drug use. Another misconception is that harm reduction encourages use. Rather, harm reduction recognizes that when licit or illicit drug use is happening, there are effective strategies to make it less harmful. Let's use an analogy here. If people are having sex where a condom would be helpful to reduce the harms, then condoms are provided. Providing the condom does not say anything about approving or disapproving of the sexual act itself. Rather, it says, if the sexual act is happening, here is a way to make it safer. Similarly, if people are using drugs where naloxone would be helpful to reduce harms, then naloxone is provided. Providing the naloxone does not say anything about approving or disapproving of the drug use itself. Rather, it says, if drug use is happening, here is a way to make it safer. Some of the principles of harm reduction include providing a spectrum of strategies from safer use to managed use to abstinence, and we'll talk about that lots more in a few slides. Another one is addressing the conditions of use. The reasons are unique to each person and they may change over time. Sometimes people are using because it's what's known or for pleasure and entertainment or a sense of well-being. Sometimes pills from a provider aren't working anymore or aren't available anymore. Sometimes street drugs can be cheaper than other kinds of care. Some people use because they're escaping, coping, or numbing, or distancing from emotions or feelings of unworthiness, or to soften the pain of another trouble. Many people use because they're self-medicating for anxiety, depression, trauma, or other mental health concerns. And some people use to stay awake all night or to squelch hunger or cold. Another principle is approaching with a non-judgmental, non-coercive provision of services and resources. So what this means is to provide services whether or not somebody is ready to make behavior changes. In other words, people deserve care, period. Not people deserve care when they do X, Y, or Z, just people deserve care. Harm reduction asks care providers to meet everyone where they're at. In order to do this, it is important to know why and how drug use started or why somebody is considering using. The last principle we'll go over today is including the voice and insight of people that use or have used drugs in the creation of programs and policies. Some of you may have heard the phrase, nothing about us without us. Sometimes when we talk about the opioid epidemic or injection use, drug use specifically, an image comes to mind. This image is often a person who is in a very chaotic use pattern, possibly homeless, publicly using, involved in public disturbances, criminal behavior, or in a mental health crisis. While some or all of these concerns might be present, it is important to understand that there is a spectrum of drug use and people go in and out of different drug use patterns. Harm reduction applies to anyone along the drug use spectrum. Some people use experimentally, just once or a few times. Some people use occasionally, like once a month or on the weekends or when with certain friends or with certain symptoms or with certain life events. Some people use regularly, they have routine use. It's a part of routine, daily, regular life. It may be fairly regulated or stable. Some people use chaotically, sometimes a little where they may be experiencing withdrawal, withdrawal sometimes a lot, sometimes mixing with other substances, and you might see a period of detox, use, detox, and use. If we were going to use a metaphor for this, this would be roller coaster use. Regular use would be like a carousel. Occasional use would be like whack-a-mole. And experimental use would be like skydiving, usually with the intent of pleasure seeking. The patterns of when and how and where someone injects can change over time. Typically, a person who injects will fall into a pattern that works to balance the need to get high, the symptoms of withdrawal, and what is financially feasible. 
Some people who inject drugs inject multiple times a day in smaller doses to have a somewhat stable high. Other people who inject drugs may inject only a few times a day and then wait until withdrawal symptoms have just begun so that the surge from the drug is more dramatic and the contrast between withdrawal and high are more distinct. Terry Morris spoke at the Harm Reduction Summit in White Earth a few years ago and provided the following quote about people who are using injection drugs in a chaotic pattern. She says, life is lived out in the elements, no privacy, nowhere to shower, dirty clothes, you might not get eye contact all day. You inject in the park, library, stairwell, or parking ramp. You have a hard time keeping up with your basic needs. You have track marks and wounds that won't heal. You've been robbed, you've been assaulted. You deal with malnutrition, cellulitis, MSRA, HIV, HCV, syphilis, lack of sleep, fractures, dumpsters, turning tricks, panhandling, no clean water, scabies, lice, diarrhea, constipation, ulcers, amputations, isolation, stigma, and even death. It is most common at this time for support groups to either be a sober group or an active use group. But one example of an inclusive support group is based in California and it's called Come As You Are. Come high, come low, come sober, come crashing. Some people who come to this group are simply looking, taking a look at their youth. How does it serve them? How is it hard? Other people are looking to use more safely with safe company, clean needles, or in a safe place. Others want a space to talk about what is underlying their youth their depression, anxiety, or trauma, and some are looking to eliminate one drug, reduce their use, or eliminate use altogether. One of the benefits of having an inclusive group is that people who relapse can continue to attend the same group where they have those established relationships. There's a lot of information sharing across the various groups. People who are shelving one drug, or meaning abstaining from one drug for a period of time, are able to ask questions about withdrawal symptoms, and people who are in full abstinence are reminded about the consequences of daily or chaotic use. It's important to know that each drug use is a distinct experience with unique circumstances. If someone is using after a period of sobriety, they are at greater risk of overdose death. If a person has been using for many days continuously, then they're at risk for not being able to inject safely, missing a vein or measuring incorrectly. When the need that's met is getting high, a person may be extremely sleep deprived, dehydrated, or may display other erratic behavior. Using harm reduction requires a full understanding of behavior change. Let's imagine any behavior change. We'll use exercise as an example. I think we've all tried that. <laughs> um, and there are many stages of change. So let's think about what the stages of change would sound like if we're using exercise as an example. So I'm working on the left-hand side of the slide right now. Exercise more? Ha, good one. I know there's health benefits to exercising, but yeah, right, it's just not happening right now. I know I need to exercise more, but I'm thinking about exercising, maybe at this club or that club, maybe I'll sign up for a class, maybe a friend would go with me. I took some steps towards my goal. I was on track for a few days, but then I'm back on track. I've had success this week. What's important to note in this exercise example is number one, does a person think about a behavior change and then immediately do it? Absolutely not. Number two, people spend a huge amount of time in pre-contemplative and contemplative stages of change, considering how or when a behavior change could or might happen. And number three, starting exercising, this is not even really a fair comparison to overcoming a substance use disorder, but at least it gives us a picture of how many steps come before actually making or starting to make a change touring a gym, getting a three-day trial, trying a class package somewhere else when you didn't like the first gym, going on a family trip and losing the momentum to get started, an injury or any other demand that pulls you away from that original goal. 
Harm reduction does a great job of recognizing all that goes into behavior change and truly meeting people where they're at. Understanding behavior change is a motivational interviewing tool. Another tool that's commonly used in harm reduction is SPERT, which stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. What this looks like is using a simple screening tool. For example, here I have listed the four questions from CAGE Aid. CAGE is loosely an acronym for cut down, annoyed, guilty, and eye opener. Aid mean, meaning adapted to include drugs. So the questions here are, have you ever felt that you ought to cut down on your drinking or drug use? Have people annoyed or criticized you about your drinking or drug use? Have you ever felt bad or guilty because of your drinking or drug use? And have you ever had a drink or used drugs first thing in the morning to steady your nerves or get rid of a hangover or withdrawal? For a brief intervention, it's a client-focused integrative health approach. Here I have listed the flow of a session from motivational interviewing being engagement, focusing, evoking, and planning if ready. I'll go over an example of that in a minute. The last step is a referral to treatment. And if you're employing a harm reduction approach, then treatment could be substance use disorder treatment, peer recovery coaches, support groups, sterile supplies, really any medical, mental, dental, sexual, or chemical health service referrals, or linkage to care. Let me provide an example of harm reduction when applied to alcohol in a brief intervention. In engagement, it would sound like, what are your thoughts about substance use at this time? Or what's been going on with your alcohol use the last few days? In focusing, it sounds like, what do you want to talk about today? Or what's most important about your alcohol use at this time? In evoking, it would sound like, what are you worried or afraid could happen? What things are you considering or struggling with? What support do you need right now? What would it look like if things got better next week or next month? What are all the reasons that you want it to be different? What is the best possible outcome you can imagine at this time? And planning would sound like, let's talk specifics. If you were going to focus on one thing this week, what feels manageable? And as with any motivational interviewing strategy, we would always honor sustained talk. The same talk is the desire, ability, reason, and need not to change. What that sounds like is things like, um, you want to figure this out, or it takes a lot of courage to talk about these things, or you're not hearing what you want to hear. And with any motivational interviewing strategy, we would use open-ended questions to evoke or draw out change talk. Change talk is the desire, ability, reason, or need to change. So that would sound like, what's been working so far? You have the skill to do this when you're ready. Affirming autonomy is a huge part of motivational interviewing. Or you're noticing that in providing a reflection about what you're hearing or witnessing in their, their body language. Some programs take an abstinence-only approach or do not support the use of medication-assisted treatment, MAT, in recovery. Everyone has their own recovery journey, and however someone finds recovery is a good way. And today we are talking about harm reduction. So instead of potentially a three-step process, using, not using, being in recovery, harm reduction breaks down the steps into more manageable and in many cases, more realistic steps. Let's carry on with this alcohol example that we were using. First, it might be looking at stabilizing some health conditions, medication compliance, or getting connected to additional resources and supports for other health conditions that could have been exacerbated by or overlooked due to substance use. Next, we might move on to safer use. How can you have a safety plan for each use circumstance? What agreements, limits, or protocols can be agreed upon during a non-use time to address any emergencies that may arise during use? What additional support do loved ones need 
to respond to, address, or cope with the youth? How could we reduce the harms of, associated with drinking? Then maybe we would look at regulated use, keeping track of use like measuring pores, tallying drinks, or keeping notes of behavior associated with use, talking about the impacts of use on your own life and others. Next, we might look at moderated use. What, if anything, could change to decrease or moderate the use? looking at weekly or daily goals, such as only drinking beer during the week, or measuring alcohol use on the weekend and noting effects. Or this could be around incorporating other health improvements, like increasing water intake or physical activity, adhering to medication regimen, or only using one substance at a time. Next, we might move on to consider treatment options. This would be identifying a care team, even before it's needed, somebody who's willing to talk about harm reduction strategies, not only abstinence, and where to go if and when the person is ready to learn about different treatment programs. In the case of alcohol, this might be detox, an inpatient program, outpatient program, or antabuse. The point here is that there's a continuum of care and there are many steps before and after somebody agrees to, finds, and completes treatment. When we talk about injection drug use, one of the topics that comes up today is about fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Any new fentanyl analogs that are coming on the market are termed novel substances, simply meaning new substances. There's been really confusing messaging out there about fentanyl analogs. There was some, some information that went around about pink death and gray death. And while it may be useful to a police officer to know what color a particular substance is for drug seizures or drug investigations, it actually can increase the danger for a person who is using drugs because they may think if it looks like X, it will act like Y and that's simply not the case. The same color, size, and appearance of a prescription may not necessarily be a prescription. It could, in fact, be a counterfeit pill, an illicitly produced counterfeit prescription. The same color, size, and appearance of a drug that you used before may not necessarily be the product. People used to think that using the same dealer meant that you would have consistency in product but even the dealers don't know what's in their supply these days. So these simple messages are ones that you can incorporate into your messaging about novel substances. If a person purchases drugs off the street or possibly online, you don't know what you're getting, the color and appearance of the drug does not indicate anything about its contents or potency, and we can assume that most or all counterfeit prescriptions and illicit drugs are unpredictable and adulterated. Adulterated means that it contains multiple substances, is laced or mixed. For the sake of time, we're not gonna watch this video, but just know that it's out there. It does a good job of explaining the risks and debunking the myths about fentanyl exposures. It's geared towards first responders and a law enforcement audience, but it's really good for anyone who's interested in learning about fentanyl. Another harm reduction strategy is to decrease the, is to discuss the circumstances of use. The idea here is that each drug use circumstance is unique. What drug, how it's taken, where it's taken, what is likely to happen, and where your body is at that day, all of these conditions matter. And what education is provided or the safety plan would be different depending on these conditions. To address the harms of each drug use circumstance, inquire about the drug. What type of drug is being used? What is it cut with? In what manner is it being taken? If meth is being taken by smoking or injecting, then if IV supplies aren't available, this person is less likely to put themselves at risk because they could smoke as well. Or if a person has an obligation in a few hours, Smoking is a better option so that they can feel the onset and it doesn't come all at once. The setting. What is the environment like? 
How do others feel about their use? What do they anticipate will happen? If this person was going to use in a party atmosphere, then the conversation might be around sexual safety or finding someone to observe the injection. If this person was going to use alone, then the conversation might be about ensuring the person has access to clean water, a cooker, cotton, and multiple needles. Body. What is their tolerance? How is their emotional well-being? Reducing harm during use has a lot to do with addressing the headspace that someone is in when they use. Have they been awake for four to five days and are disorganized in their thoughts? Then the conversation would probably be about safe injection practices. If this person is feeling guilty about their use or has had a recent loss, then the conversation might be about family dynamics, sexual safety during use, or even suicidal ideation assessments. Harm reduction is about preventing harms, the gravest of these harms being death, and so overdose prevention education fits right into harm reduction. There are some simple steps or harm reduction strategies for injecting more safely. One needle, one use. Do not share needles with others and do not reuse your own needle. Needles are cheaply made and become dull after one attempt. I'll show a picture next to amplify this point. If you miss the vein, stick again with a fresh needle. No sharing. No sharing needles, cookers, wipes, or tourniquets. All supplies needed to inject have the potential to pass infectious diseases. Rotate injection sites. Scar tissue develops under injection sites, and it is important to change the location and the site of the injection. Use soap and water at the injection site. When possible, use with someone, take turns, observe for signs and symptoms of an overdose. If people use the same supply at the same time and that supply is least or not the potency that they expected, then both people are at risk of overdose at the same time and will be unable to help each other. Rather, if people take turns, then there is someone who can intervene in an emergency if needed. Plan ahead. Stock up in needles, cotton, sterile water, and a variety of needle sizes, and have a safety plan. Just as with alcohol, for example, where you would identify a sober driver, or if you were going to take an Uber or Lyft, you wouldn't accept an open drink, you might have water in between drinks. This is the type of thing we're talking about with a safety plan. And have naloxone available. Tell your family and friends that you carry naloxone in case of an emergency. Carry multiple doses if possible. If someone is using alone, it is important to keep the door unlocked and leave out the naloxone kit in plain view. This is the picture about why it is important to use one needle one time. Again, needles are made cheaply and they dull after only one use. Re reusing one's own needle poses risk for soft tissue damage and infections. We've talked a little bit about naloxone, and I want to elaborate here. Naloxone is the medication that blocks the effects of an opioid during an opioid overdose emergency. Naloxone is available in many different ways in Minnesota. First, a prescription from a provider. Second, pharmacies that participate in the naloxone protocol. Third, first responders, EMS, fire, and police, and community-based organizations. Many reversals are done by peers or loved ones. Naloxone has no adverse effects, and it is only effective on opioids. If the person is unresponsive for another reason, while there's no consequences or adverse effects, also there would be no benefit. It wouldn't work unless the cause of the overdose was opioids. It is, the recommendation is to provide naloxone if a person is unresponsive and if you are uncertain why. Because of Steve's law or the Good Samaritan law, any layperson can administer naloxone when acting in good faith. It's important to note that even if the drug of choice is methamphetamine or cocaine, many drugs have been found in Minnesota to be laced with fentanyl and fentanyl analogs or heroin 
And so it's important to carry naloxone even if opioids are not the drug of choice. I want to make sure that we have time to talk about syringe access and syringe service programs, how and where to get help. So I'm going to move on. So syringe access. This is the legislation that allows any pharmacy to sell up to 10 syringes without a prescription. This law was passed by the Minnesota State Legislature and it began July 1, 1998. Since then, people were able to purchase up to 10 new syringes or needles without a prescription at any pharmacy that voluntarily participates with this initiative. This is a public health strategy that's supported by the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO, and the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. So again, syringe access refers to the legislation that allows pharmacies to sell up to 10 syringes. On the Minnesota Department of Health website, there is a list of all the participating pharmacies that you can search by county. Syringe service programs are programs that provide services to reduce the harms associated with drug use and prevent HIV and viral hepatitis infection. MDH-funded syringe service programs provide HIV and hepatitis C prevention, testing, and linkage to care, naloxone kits, overdose prevention education, including safer injection practices, sharps containers and safe disposal of used syringes, sterile syringes and other supplies at no cost, referrals to medical, mental, and sexual health services, and referrals to substance use disorder treatment and recovery support. If we haven't already covered this, let's review the data about the need for syringe service programs in Minnesota. There's been a 300% increase in injection drug use between 2007 and 2017. The emergence of novel substances like fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. There's more than 34,000 people living in Minnesota with chronic hepatitis C infection. And last year alone, there were 284 new cases of HIV in Minnesota. There are many benefits of syringe service programs. SSPs reduce needle stick injuries. One in three officers are stuck with a needle during their career. Syringe service programs provide resources and education on proper disposal for people who use drugs. In 2018, the MDH-funded syringe service programs took in 500,000 used syringes. SSPs reduced needle stick injuries to law enforcement by 66%. SSPs reduced drug overdose deaths. More than 400 Minnesotans died of an opioid-involved death in 2017. Syringe service programs teach people who use drugs how to respond to an overdose emergency using naloxone and how to prevent overdoses through safer injection practices. Research shows that SSPs do not cause an increase in drug use. Syringe service programs reduce the incidence of HIV and Hep C infections. Sharing syringes and drug use equipment can transmit HIV and Hep C. In 2017, there were 284 new cases of HIV and more than 34,000 people living with hepatitis C in Minnesota. Syringe service programs routinely provide HIV and Hep C testing. 14% of the Hep C tests conducted in 2018 at the MDH-funded SSPs were positive. SSPs provide linkage to care and reduce transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. SSPs reduce infectious disease treatment costs. In 2018, MDH-funded SSPs distributed 678,000 sterile syringes, reducing the risk of transmission of infectious disease. For hepatitis C, the average 12-week treatment cost is $84,000. The estimated lifetime cost of treating one person living with HIV is $379,000. Syringe service programs increase the likelihood to enter treatment. This might be the most important point. When people participate in a syringe service program, 
they are five times more likely to enter treatment for substance use disorder and more likely to reduce or stop injecting. Syringe service programs meet people where they're at, providing a safe place to connect with services, and then if and when they are ready to enter treatment, they know where to go to get that help. In 2018, the MDH-funded syringe service program serves 6,815 unique clients, many of which are clients who do not engage with care elsewhere. The MDH-funded syringe service programs in Minnesota include Indigenous Peoples Task Force, Just Us Health, which is the merger of Rainbow Health Initiative and Minnesota AIDS Project, Native American Community Clinic, or NAC, North Point Health and Wellness, their program is called In and Out, Ramsey County Clinic 555, and Rural AIDS Action Network, or RAN, in Duluth. There is a syringe service program calendar hosted by Just Us Health that shows the hours and locations of the syringe service programs. This is kept up to date if and when there are any changes or additions to the syringe service program service hours. The SSPs work as a network with each other to strive for as much coverage as possible throughout the day and each day of the week. The majority of SSPs are in the Twin Cities, with the exception of Duluth, Mankato, Grand Rapids, and Manoman. It is important to note that MDH-funded SSPs are not all of the syringe service programs in Minnesota. Others include Hennepin County Red Door Services, White Earth Harm Reduction Coalition, RAN Mankato, Northern Minnesota Harm Reduction, and Southside Harm Reduction are just a few in closing, synthetic opioids are driving the continued increase in opioid-involved deaths in Minnesota. There's been a 300% increase in injection drug use in Minnesota from 2000 to 2017. Syringe service programs provide sterile supplies and a wide range of services to address the harms associated with injection drug use and reduce the transmission of infectious disease. If people are using drugs, do not use alone, carry naloxone, train those around you to carry and use naloxone, and have a safety plan for every time you use. MDH hosts the Opioid Dashboard, which is a one-stop shop for opioid-related data and information. Topics include overdose death, non-fatal overdose, substance use disorder, prescribing practices, supply, diversion, harm reduction, co-occurring conditions, and social determinants of health. There are many places on the opioid dashboard, dashboard where you can look up county-level data. You can find it by entering the words opioid dashboard into a search engine or www.health.state.mn.us slash opioid dashboard. Here's my contact information, and I want to know that anytime you want to send a question, we will either answer it ourselves or find somebody who can on our team. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kate. So we have about 10 minutes left, so we can open up the floor for some questions. So for those of you that have been hanging on to some questions, feel free to type those in either to the chat box or that Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Yeah. I want to note, too, I caught a typo in my slide. On my closing slide, there's been a 300% increase in injection drug use just in the last 10 years, so between 2007 and 2017. So if I had ran it for longer than a decade, it would actually be a larger increase. So I just wanted to correct myself. Apologies for that. And you know, on that note, Kate, there's a question that, you know, when we were looking at the, the maps earlier with that increase over the 10 years, but yep. then you noted that the majority of SSPs are located in the Twin Cities with the exception yep. of a couple of those rural towns. Do you anticipate that because there's higher injection drug use in rural communities that we're going to see more SSPs in those areas or are those, is that growth kind of stagnant 
at this point in time? I sure hope so. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, a wonderful resource toolkit on the opioid dashboard under the Supply Diversion Harm Reduction section and then the Resources tab about starting a syringe service program in rural areas. And absolutely there is the need. There needs to be more funding for it and then there needs to be agencies who are ready to move on that. Syringe service programs are, are very flexible. They can be a part of local public health, a part of a, a clinic, a standalone service. There's many different models for how a syringe service program can exist in a community. Okay, so then there's another question. Um, when we are looking at the Danes data early on in the presentation, do you have any information on how Minnesota compares to other states? In treatment admissions? Yeah. That would be a Department of Human Services question. Okay. Yep. yep. And then also on that note, I know that you had noted that about one in 10 people who have substance use disorder actually get into treatment. That's um, right. Can you talk a little bit about the barriers that are preventing folks from accessing treatment services? So again, Department of Human Services is the, the authority on, on treatment, but I can comment a little bit on some of the many factors. So obviously stigma is a huge piece of what prevents people from accessing the treatment and recovery supports that they need. Second, it's actually a lack of knowledge, skill, know-how of where and how to even get help. People need help navigating the referral to treatment. Um, Department of Human Services is underway in substance use disorder reform, and a piece of that is having peer recovery support and treatment navigation as a billable service to help people navigate that system. Um, the other piece is actual availability of services. So having enough openings for people when they're ready. There's been a huge push over the last years to expand the availability of office-based buprenorphine programs or Suboxone, it's called OBOT, Office-Based Opioid Treatment, um, because any provider can get a MAT waiver and be a buprenorphine provider. So uh, buprenorphine can be a part of a primary care setting. So, I mean, there's, there's so many, so many barriers. Um, another piece that we see is when somebody completes a Rule 25 assessment, then there's a wait period for the assessment summary and plan to be finished, and then potentially more wait time for a bed to open. And that wait time is definitely a risky time for overdose, relapse, um, and, and again, a part of substance use disorder reform that Department of Human Services is undergoing is to reduce that wait time between expressed interest and treatment entry. Okay, thank you. And then another question. So I know there are some tips about the overdose prevention, education, and some of the safer use tips. How are those currently being communicated to individuals who are using intravenous drugs? Mm -hmm. So the syringe service programs are really one of the main experts about this and they are serving people who use drugs and people who inject drugs. And so part of their work is having one-on-one -on -one discussions with their clients about, about each drug use circumstance and how to reduce the harms associated with drug use. Okay. And then, so again, with that map, we saw that some of those northern communities have been the hardest hit. Do you have any- they're at risk. So, okay. so this is important to note. This is a vulnerability assessment. So it's not hardest hit, it's that they are vulnerable to rapid dissemination or 
spread of hepatitis C because of some factors. And those factors were determined by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in this analysis. What's important to note is that MDH is actually replicating this analysis and hope to have the results by fall of this year. And in that analysis, we're adding in a few more variables that take a look at risk factors associated with injection drug use, the availability of treatment, the race rate disparity and drug overdose death, and a few other factors so that we have as sophisticated an analysis as possible to understand which counties are most at risk of rapid dissemination of HCV, and keeping in mind that that's only one of the benefits of syringe service programs. Okay, great. All right, well, I think that's all. So many great questions. questions. Yeah, yeah. I think that's all the questions we had for today, unless anyone has a burning question they want to get off of their chest before we wrap up here. All right, well, thank you so much, Kate. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you. I put up my email and phone again and the link to the opioid dashboard and really encourage people to reach out directly with any questions and I'll share them with my team. All right, excellent. And we'd also wanna encourage everyone on the webinar to please complete the survey about this webinar. You'll receive that via email later today and your responses are just gonna help us identify future topics so we can have more great webinars such as the one today. And we hope to see everybody again next week for the webinar and the opioid epidemic response. Oh, excuse me, that's a lecture, that's in person. So thank you again and have a great week.